completely destroyed. The streets just full of uh, residents that have been affected um, by this earthquake. Um, presence of some UN soldiers. The images from Haiti are heartbreaking. Homes, hospitals, and schools are destroyed. Families searching for loved ones, parents trying to feed their children. But we can all do something. In these difficult hours, America stands united. We stand united with the people of Haiti, who have shown such incredible resilience, and we will help them to recover and to rebuild. This is going to be an exciting trip, but I'm sure that many of these students will really benefit for some time to come. Uh, Global education, you know what I'm saying? It don't get no better than this, you know. I'm looking forward to see how they react to the various cultural experiences they will have during the course of our stay in Haiti. Everyone was very excited to experience this international community service adventure. Yeah. Hey, we're going up to the mountain to the village school to help out with either teaching, cleaning, or painting. This is about to be a great and wonderful experience for all of us. You know, just to engage with the village people and learn more from them and learn more of what they're about and to just find our place in order to like help and better improve like their situation if we can. They got us climbing up this mountain early in the morning. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. But check it out though. Oh! Bonjour. This is definitely very interesting. Very interesting. Check this out. This is how people in Haiti are living. Bonjour. How you feeling, doctor? Good. <laughs> Climbing up this mountain. Halfway there. Not that bad. Definitely exercise. The drive up is about an hour and a half or so because of the road conditions. And then once we leave the car, we're gonna have another hour walk to the village. To the same village? Yeah. But we're gonna be coming from the top instead okay. of the bottom. When we make it to the top of the hill, right what's gonna be happening? Relaxing, we have um, to do a survey of the village overall. Well, it's great to be here. My name is Rami. Um, it's really good to be able to climb this with Morehouse students, learning more about Haitian culture, the issues and the challenges that students in Haiti face, um, to access simple, um, what we would consider rights in the states, um, things that are required location. So it's been transformative right now, just to really be with people 
that have to make this trek, that don't have a choice, to see how fortunate we are um, in the States to be able to have what we have and do what we do. <laughs> We're close. Bonjour. Okay, now we're in the village. We just arrived. Bonjour. Bonjour. This is how Haitians are living. This is uh, some huts, some clothes. As you can see, the architecture isn't that great. We're actually getting ready to go to church with them right about now. So I can't wait to see how this experience is going to be. Climbing this mountain in Haiti allowed me to experience what it's like to be a citizen in rural Haiti. The Haitian people that live in this particular area have to climb up and down this mountain on a daily basis to attend school as well as to import and export goods. And I literally did not see one car or any form of transportation as we were hiking up this mountain. church service. It was wonderful. It was very enriching. Getting ready to head back down the hill. They live in man. We got it so made in the United States. You know, walking through this Haitian village, I was immediately shocked by the vast amount of poverty. Never in my life have I ever experienced anything like this, and this was just the beginning. Today we're going to the embassy. We're going to meet uh, one of our top ambassadors. When we arrived at the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince, I was told that I am not allowed to film anything on this premises for security purposes. Today, uh, we went up to the embassy. Really great. I mean, it was a lot of procedural stuff. They took 
call our phone. I accidentally took a picture. The man took my phone to leave the picture for me. Uh, we went through uh, several different areas in the uh, embassy. Uh, the most secure level one. Uh, so we got to see different uh, sections of uh, counseling. Port-au-Prince doing a little shopping, just left the embassy. Enjoying our time to Haiti. Today we will be taking a tour of several Haitian universities so we can experience how their collegiate life is. I'm looking forward to this. Instead of saying like, instead of saying that uh, we try, we we're not trying to remember that they die, but trying to remember that they live. They live yeah. So we have the rector, the president making a speech. We have people gathering, and everybody's invited. You know, you didn't know the people. If you're from the school, you can come. We have pictures online too. You said 12 people died since the school's been built. No, not 12 people. For the earthquake, during the earthquake, oh, okay. about 12 okay. people okay. died. Something that stood out to me at this college was the credentials of the degree. Specifically, if you graduate from this institution in Haiti, your degree is only primarily respected in the country of Haiti. And the reason behind that fact is because the educational standards are not equivalent to most countries' educational standards. That's the reason we are here to travel here. How to deal with our families? We don't have to go to the culture and have a mental. I came to Haiti because I teach about the Haitian Revolution and Haitian history to some extent every every year. And I wanted to come to a place that in many ways should be a special pilgrimage for all African people. Um, and Mr. Desi I think that Mr. Apollon the revolution haitian, so we should have a story. So we have a revolution haitian, the people of the United States, the people of America in general, 
et il était venu en Haïti pour déjà gagner expérience dans le sens de dire vraiment pour un Haïtien qui a vécu en Haïti aujourd'hui et qui n'est pas de révolution dans la communauté aujourd'hui. Um, of course, I'm a male student, but we have Spelman College also um, across the street. Um, if you're interested in studying African culture and looking at Asian culture as a part of a global African diaspora community. Yeah, the reason why I chose Morehouse is because you know, uh, I used to go to the University of Tennessee. And at the University of Tennessee, uh, me and a few parents started an organization uh, which focused on the advancement of African Americans and our problems at that institution. The reason why I chose Morehouse is that there are all the problems that moi, aux États-Unis, au Guyane, et qui je ne carré pas, mais j'ai une solution pour permettre aux sociétés à avancer en général. Avec cette organisation, j'ai réalisé que Morehouse était faisant la même chose que je faisais avec cette organisation, mais sur une plus grande scale. Et une fois que j'ai réalisé ça, j'ai réalisé que Morehouse était faisant la même chose. Ça, c'est que je crois. Mais je l'aime, mais je suis le seul avec le Monsieur Pons qui ne savent pas les Français. Donc, si vous avez des questions pour nous, vous pouvez nous parler. Someone in the audience asked the question, is anyone in a fraternity, and if so, could they step? And my boy, Ibrahim, killed it. Watch. <laughs> Now it's time for a group reflection in which we all discuss our experiences in Haiti thus far. You're driving through the city and seeing both the extremely wealthy and extremely poor. We gave um, just a, a, a much more well-rounded view of Haiti. You know what I'm saying? Like to go straight from the airport to here and go up to the mountaintop, it was like a completely different dynamic. I'm really taking the time, uh, as Alvin said, uh, to, to, to really see different vantage points of Haiti. Um, so it, it almost, you know, as we're climbing that mountain, we're getting that vantage point from, you know, the people in the village and uh, what they're living like. And I think it's really important, you know, you know, for me, I'm looking at it through the lens of a, uh, as somebody who would, who would be a person that, if there were to be community organizations here, which I, you know, I don't know about now, but if there were to be community organizations here, how would we be able to mobilize? different people in different geographical uh, areas. So, you know, I was looking at, uh, especially the people in the village, they would represent a more rural type of poor rather than you have uh, Port-au-Prince and you have a more urban poor. My entire perception about um, a, US, a U.S. embassy was that you had a whole bunch of American people, like that's, all, like that's all you had working in one place. But I was glad to see like there was Haitian people and there was some diversity there to consult, you know, people from the poorest of this culture, um, you know, to ask questions and to also um, be reminded and also um, get clarity on some things. But one thing that I did find very interesting was that, you know, though the U.S., um, they seem to be very, like, open and accepting of, of allowing Haitian allowing people to come to and from, you know, to get visas. And it, it was very interesting to, to find out that they go through an interview process, and it's not that it's not very long, but it's so subjective. So you get this one person at the end of the interview who can who can um, you present what you want to go to the U.S. for, and and they grant you with permission or not, you know, to go based on you know if they think what you have presented to them is, is reliable or dependable. I've always been very skeptical of the U.S. government, mm -hmm. um, so. Putting the faces to these organizations was uh, it was really neat, especially yesterday when we met the representatives from USAID. Um, we talked about the work they did. Um, one thing that kind of really stuck out to me is that um, 
a lot of what the work they're doing is they're trying to help people, but it's very uh, bureaucratic and it's business. Um, it's, I think we're almost past the phase of disaster profiteering. Mm -hmm. We're past that stage. There's definitely a lot of it that happened um, during the earthquake. And I'm glad I was at Morehouse when um, the earthquake happened because I was able to prevent some of those funds going to the wrong hands, um, or what I perceive to be the wrong hands. And if you think about the, earth, the comments I was making earlier, is because by nature, I'm personally very skeptical about donating money to an NGO that you don't know what their working reputations are. They are scared to go out of their cocoon. Mm -hmm. They're instructed by security not to go out to interact with people. The patients want to deal with them, they got to come to the embassy and they got to go through this process that you went through and it's embarrassing. It's, yeah. it's an insult uh, to the host country nationals. And I just think that we as a country, something's got to change. We can't continue to live in a cocoon when we're working in a country where we find to help them get a job done. Haiti is categorized as the Afghanistan of the Caribbean. Critical. That really shows you the disparity that there is. So it's it's very unfortunate and I wholeheartedly agree. And the whole pol and it's not something I was unfamiliar with, but the whole policy for instance that embassy employees have to live across the street in a pretty much militarized compound yeah. and then just cross the street to go to work and can't really interact with the people. That's a problem, especially when you're supposed to advance American interest right in your backyard. Tomorrow we'll get a chance to get even more exposure to some of the country's poverty uh, in another part of Haiti that we will visit. What satisfaction can anyone get in being happy and see his brother wallowing in dirt, filth, and disease? How can men feel happy living in luxuries when others are living in disease? And then when someone tries to help the other out of the disease, the subtle culprit talks about disloyalty. My greatest desire is to see all humanity happy. Yeah, I want to see how many houses in order for us to do, to know how many house, housing that we can make for them, you know? I already, already count 45 children. We just got here to this Haitian village. We built the foundation around. As you can see, the next move is we're going to lay down the sand and cement to make a flat surface. And uh, we just started, so it's going to be hard later, but we're ready. busy we are starting to mix the concrete and make sure that everything is in place we are putting a layer of rocks down we are finishing up the foundation and we're moving rubble uh, from within the site that will become the community center so it's been pretty exciting we have a lot more to do but we're taking lunch break and then we'll be back uh, making some more cement and making sure that everything gets laid evenly and that all the lava has been removed or is dispersed evenly on the floor. So right now we're building a community center that serves the purpose of providing clean water and sanitation to the people living in the village. After we finish, Jacques took us on a historical tour of Haiti. Smith's Lava.
palaces between 1810 and 1813, so it was built currently with the citadel on top of the mountain behind it. You can't really see the citadel from here, but the citadel protects the valley down below. So any intruders to the palace would first have to overcome the barrage of cannon fire from the citadel. He built this palace to try and, um, according to scholars, both the um, Palais de Versailles in France and also one of the Prussian empires um, in Russia. So it, it, the main reason behind their train of thought for why he built it this way is to, to, to mirror the palaces in Europe is because those were built during the Enlightenment period in Europe and to show really what black people are able to do on this side of the hemisphere. We're literally walking on earth where some of the most powerful men once dwelled. Such a priceless feeling. So we're basically in this Haitian palace, looking at the, uh, the old architecture and structure of this palace. 360 rooms was in here. This is grand living for a king. It's very nice, very nice. Right now we are at the Citadel, um, constructed by or underneath the, the leadership of Henry Christophe, immediately following the Haitian Revolution. Um, it took about 15 years to complete everything it is that you see here. We have approximately 10,000 cannons, balls, 365 cannons surrounding this fortress that sits at about 35, or excuse me, 3,000 feet. Um, real humbling experience to see the black folks all around the world have, have constructed monuments such as this pyramids um, 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 and really just goes to show what a person can do when the human spirit is truly tested. This is the living quarters but this is the woman's living quarters and it's named Bat Batterie Marie Louise that's Christophe's wife's name. So this is the um, wing for his wife and the uh, women. So this first square structure that you see here is the forward looking post because when the citadel was almost complete he wanted to start expanding it over th this mountaintop as I mentioned. So this forward-looking post was to be able to defend from anyone who would try to invade from this side. And then the second square-looking building over there, that's where they started building the molasses and putting the construction material to be able to continue the fortress, uh, expand the fortress that way. So this chain of mountain is called um, La Chaine du Bonnet à l'Evêque. So Bonnet à l'Evêque. And it's just because the way it's shaped. And every time he would Christophe chose this chain of mountain because it's very remote, very steep on both sides and a very strong bedrock foundation. But every time he would try to start a foundation on that other side, he encountered too many trees that he had to chop down. So he asked the owner of this mountain top, which was called um, La Fioyelle, and he just built it on top of this one because there were much less trees, it was just mo mostly bushes and the rocks were bigger too so it would allow for a bigger structure. So Christophe wanted to build this to go higher so he can see Port-au-Prince from here. That's horrible to see. Because Port-au-Prince is back that way. It's one of the only few that was able to protect against uh, sea invasion and land invasion at the same time and for the land invasion component because Haitians won the Battle of Independence mostly using guerrilla tactics, this citadel and its location allows you to protect against any kind of potential guerrilla warfare as well. So conventional armies, and we're talking 1800s, so it was more structured than it is today, um, or at least the flanks, the ranks were more structured, uh, the way they would organize, and guerrilla warfare. So it was the land portion was able to protect against both of those. So it makes it a pretty unique fortification structure in the Americas. You know, I really enjoyed the traveling and sightseeing in Haiti. It was absolutely beautiful. But my favorite part about this entire experience was definitely the community service. So what we've come up with is a real development project to improve the quality of the people living in the village that we've been working in, which I think is a fantastic idea. It shows that wild men are capable of designing and doing things beyond what they've been trained to do, even as college students. There is no doubt in my mind that Morehouse
Charles College has inspired me to become a philanthropist. There's an air of an expectancy that a Morehouse man will always stand for something noble and high. We have all been very fortunate to attend one of the most prestigious colleges in the world. So it's only right that we give back to show our appreciation. Giving back is such an indescribable feeling of compassion. To know that you're making a significant difference in the world is tremendously fulfilling. Everyone needs help in becoming self-reliant. Success is impossible without the assistance of someone. Think about it. I'd like to first thank the people of the United States, the government, and you, Mr. President, for always standing by the Haitian people. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the First Lady, Michelle Obama in Haiti after the earthquake. I'd like to thank her for her support also. So thank you for hosting me. It's an honor to be here. Hello again, America. Haiti is a very beautiful country, man. Very nice people. Dr. Cole's riding a donkey. Don't get no better than that. I'm to do it in America. I'm to do it one time. Basically out here finishing up the service project, gathering these last bit of rocks, then we're gonna head home and eat some lunch. We had a very wonderful day, a very productive day, always doing something good in the community. What's up in Creole? The Haitians use that phrase often, so I just thought it'd be cool to name a movie that. Uh, the good news is that because of not just the mobilization of international support, uh, which the U.S. helped to lead, but also because of uh, strong uh, leadership from the Haitian people themselves and 
uh, President uh, Martelli, uh, we've begun to see progress. Uh, the economy is growing, security is improving, uh, infrastructure is uh, getting rebuilt, uh, rubble has been removed, uh, health facilities are beginning to uh, open up, uh, schools are starting to get back into place, and businesses are starting to return to Haiti. Mr. Coles and Miss Richmond for this opportunity. I'm glad I went on an alternative spring break trip to Haiti. So there you have it. I just want to tell you thank you for taking the time out of your very busy day to watch my film, Sac Passe. That really means a lot to me. But before you go, I want you to check out my idea for a new television show that's very similar to my film that you just viewed. I hope you enjoy it. What if I received a grant or found a sponsor who could help me do community service projects in some of the most impoverished locations around the world? Wouldn't that be awesome? Let's say, for example, Mexico, which is a beautiful country with a rich history, but has a great need for sustainable housing. Me, along with a team of about 15 to 25 volunteers, would all fly out to Mexico to help build adequate homes for at-need families. Not to mention building a soccer field for the children to play on after school. Or what about Sierra Leone? who despite having some of the world's most luxurious natural resources, still has a major water pollution issue. In fact, over 2 million citizens in Sierra Leone do not have access to clean water. So me and my group of outstanding volunteers would fly to Sierra Leone and help build numerous water wells throughout several different communities in this country. Wouldn't that be great? Or what about the country of India? where over 400 million people have zero access to electricity. Me, along with my amazing crew of volunteers, would travel to India and help construct solar panels in specific areas that could greatly benefit from this service. The name of my television show would be called Let's Make It Happen because we would identify the significant need of the community that we're serving at, write out a detailed plan, and then make it happen. If you are interested in donating to help me fund this television show, please go to my GoFundMe page. I love and appreciate your support.